Yes, um, I'm a professor in math, science, and technology education here at Berkeley, and I teach two main courses, one having to do with programming and problem solving, sort of how people come to design computer programs and how that relates to the work that has been done in the cognitive science area on, on problem solving. And I also teach a course on the cognitive consequences of technology and education. And in that course, we're concerned with how students understand subject matter and how technology might help them to understand, especially mathematics and science. Uh, what about the, the computer revolution, the electronic revolution in the uh, The electronic revolution, you mean the, uh, the availability of computers. Is it loud enough? Oh, the noise outside. Did you close the window? Mm -hmm. And we, uh, it seems to us that we may also be looking to the this new technology that brings some of us to that place. Well, I think a lot of people believe that. Uh, my own experience is, is, in a way, parallel to that. I took uh, basically the first computer science course that was offered at Stanford University when I was an undergraduate. And we were learning ALGOL, which is um, an early programming language. And basically, there was a computer center, and we used punched cards, and you needed to go there to write your program and to submit it and get it back. And because there was a great deal of demand for using the computer, the best turnaround time was starting about 11 o'clock at night. And so all the members of the class would essentially congregate at the computer center at about 11 o'clock, and we'd start running our programs and madly trying to get them to work. And the thing that was really annoying to me is that by m at midnight, we had a curfew for women. So I had to go back to the dormitory while all the men in the class could stay until 3 or 4 in the morning, you know, repeating their runs until their programs worked. And so it was really the first time I felt that there was definite discrimination against women. Um, and uh, it was also my first introduction to, uh, to technology and using computers. Um, as far as whether women have a different experience with technology uh, than men do, um, I think there's a great deal of, of, of thinking that's gone into trying to answer that question. And I've been impressed with the work of Sherry Turkle, who's taking a sort of psychoanalytic perspective on how women and men experience uh, the world and then how they experience uh, computers. And uh, she sort of talks about the way people construct their understanding of, of their role in society uh, and of their perception of themselves, and how they take that into the situation when they start to work with a computer. She draws on um, sort of a, a psychoanalytic perspective in arguing that uh, men and women have different experience right from birth because women relate to their mothers, so they have a same-sex experience while um, men also relate to their mothers and then they need to um, differentiate themselves from their mothers as time goes on. And she argues that this initial experience leads to different construction of personal reality and that that construction of personal reality influences the kind of experience that males and females have when they interact with computers. In our uh, research investigations, we certainly have seen differences in the kinds of uh, activities that students undertake when they work with computers. And although certainly men and women fall into all the categories of experience that we've observed, there is a propensity for women to fall into certain categories more than men, and men to fall into certain categories more than women. In particular, one, one of these categories is sort of um, trying to understand the inner workings of the computer, the electronics, sort of pushing beyond the boundaries, often uh, trying to break into computers or, or sort of understand the fundamental features of the electronics of the machine. And uh, 
what we see is that that category tends to have many more men than women in it, where in contrast, um, the category where people try to sort of create exciting and interesting and perhaps unusual solutions to problems um, is a category that we often find uh, more women than men in. Do you have an idea? I mean, what's your point of view about the reason, the reason why in science and technology until today, uh, since the beginning, there mm -hmm. are so many women, so m uh, uh, few women? So few women. Yeah. Uh, it's certainly true. The percentage of women that are involved in technological fields and in engineering, especially, um, is quite low. Engineering, it's been four to eight percent uh, women in the past, um, and I think that uh, there's a whole bunch of different explanations. It's certainly not just one. Some of the explanations that I think are particularly important are uh, ones having to do with being welcome in the, in the social group that goes along with the field. And many of um, the fields of physics and engineering, et cetera, have been traditionally um, filled almost exclusively with men. So the culture and the perception of the field, I think I would argue, has been constructed by, by males. And uh, if we assume that males and females are constructing sort of different perceptions of their self and of their experience, then it follows that uh, women will not feel as welcome in this group that's been constructed by men by virtue of the fact that they've constructed a different perspective of their self and of, of the world. Um, so I think one thing that happens is that uh, women are, are, are sort of coming to join a culture that's different from, from the kinds of cultures that they've experienced in the past. And they not only have to choose to be interested in the subject matter, but they also have to choose to change their, their way of behaving in order to conform to the norms of the culture. A great deal of research suggests that if women don't conform to the norms of the culture, that has been established for a field, that they often will be ostracized, excluded, or essentially unable to succeed in that field. Uh, so it seems really important for us to analyze what kind of a culture has built up in these domains and to determine whether that's in fact an ideal situation or whether there should be some efforts made to change the situation in order to make groups that weren't part of the group that originally created the environment welcome. Uh, can you tell me something about the uh, feminist critique of science? <laughs> I don't think there's one feminist critique of science. There's a whole bunch of different feminist critiques of science. Um, and I guess that um, the, the, the sort of the perspective that is the most common across um, feminists and indeed across modern philosophers of science as well is this constructivist perspective that I've been essentially um, talking about. And certainly I think uh, feminist philosophers but uh, philosophers in general in the recent past have been looking at the kinds of categories that, that people construct, uh, the way individuals construct the nature of difference, uh, starting from when they're very young. How do people differentiate themselves from other groups, and what are the groups that are used for making those differences? And they have argued that there are such strong characteristics for developing a sense of, 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 of female and a sense of male, and that those constructions have an impact on the nature of science. In particular, as I mentioned, most of the fields uh, such as engineering, physics, and chemistry have been predominantly uh, researched by males. So the development of a perspective in that field has been predominantly influenced by males. And a feminist critique is that to argue that had women been involved from the start, a different perspective might have emerged. Now, that's very speculative. There isn't evidence to support that perspective because we don't have examples of fields that have been constructed by females. What does exist and has been used as evidence to support this point of view um, have been the research programs of, of females that have been isolated from the mainstream of uh, science 
uh, and people have tried to compare those research programs to mainstream programs and say, well, what is special or unique about them? Obviously, they're special or unique in many ways, not necessarily just because they were constructed by women. Uh, but one feature that seems to stand out among these research programs that have been constructed by females is a more interactionist or, or broadly based perspective on the field. Uh, a primary example is the work of Barbara McClintock, who long after she did her work was finally recognized as a major contributor to the field of biology and actually awarded a Nobel Prize. Um, and one of the things that she looked at was the interaction between sort of environmental factors and genetic factors in, in the development of plants. Uh, so this is sort of taken as an example of this interactionist uh, perspective. And it's been argued that uh, as females construct their experience, uh, essentially, as potential caregivers and, and family uh, builders, they construct an interactionist view of the world. So it's a natural extension of that experience to look at scientific problems in a more interactionist way. What's the relationship between the way that science and technology is today and the scientific world? And do you believe that according to what you are saying that everything is fast with a scientific revolution? I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to. Are you referring to a sort of um, philosophical perspective or the nature of evidence or? Um, uh, well, let's say that uh, uh, the scientific revolution is mainly uh, from very later on it took man science. Uh, mm -hmm. Male science. And uh, so from very low to uh, that end, uh, the idea was always to dominate nature. You know. mm -hmm. uh, do you believe that somehow the relationship between the scientific revolution and the way that uh, uh, science and technology is today is linked? Uh, that everything is fast uh, with the scientific revolution? You know. It's linked to males? Or something yeah, like that. Yeah, I mean, as I said before, I mean we really can't know that. It's true that um, mm -hmm. it's been dominated by men. There have been very few successful women. Um, women have had difficulty breaking into the field and have not necessarily been welcomed. Mm -hmm. And so one could argue that the um, knowledge that's been constructed is knowledge that reflects a male experience and perspective. Um, however, there's no uh, alternative, so it's not possible to uh, sort of answer the question um, mm -hmm. empirically. Uh, and what about the educational system? I mean, the, uh, the university and the educational uh, system in general. Um, certainly, as far as um, defining the nature of education, uh, I think many people have argued, and, it, and it's it's supportable that. Uh, the educational system has been geared uh, toward, has been informed by philosophical perspectives that sort of say that uh, males should have uh, power and, and decision making uh, process and that females should be trained to uh, take care of family and, and be concerned about uh, uh, the well being of, of individuals. Uh, and historically, in fact, uh, women weren't, were denied access to higher education and to uh, study in fields that uh, were considered to be the purview of men. Uh, present In the present day, of course, in America, there are not virtually no programs where it would be against the law for a female to participate. It's still the case, however, that uh, the distribution of males and females in many fields is uneven. Um, a number of factors, I think, have contributed to the change in uh, access of uh, women to these various fields. One factor has been uh, essentially activism on the part of women demanding greater um, representation in a variety of fields. And under those circumstances, interestingly, um, 
the, the factors that have, I think, made it possible for women to participate more completely have often been the institutionalization of testing programs, of standardized tests that uh, allow individuals to demonstrate their ability to perform uh, independent of their racial or, or gender background. Um, today, we're, we're seeing a backlash to, to that uh, tradition in, in looking at, um, in America, standardized test scores, the scholastic aptitude test mathematics section, uh, turns out to be perhaps biased, but at least um, it turns out that many more men than women do well on that test. There's about a half a standard deviation difference in performance. Uh, it also turns out that that's anomalous. Um, if we look at a variety of other tests that are used in standardized situations, achievement tests in school, et cetera, we don't see that difference in performance. So uh, it's sort of interesting to, to note that uh, um, an opportunity has now become perhaps a, a, um, a lack of opportunity because uh, women who don't do as well on that test are often denied access to educational programs and scholarship aid and therefore less likely to be given opportunities to pursue scientific careers. But from your point of view, does technology and science drive, uh, uh, drive progress? Uh, I mean, what about your view of progress? <laughs> does technology drive progress? Does mm -hmm. science drive progress? Well, it's a topic that's been uh, greatly debated in the history of science. And um, I think that uh, there, there isn't a simple answer. Um, in any given situation, one can examine uh, the influence of technology and one can examine the influence of, of increased understanding of, of scientific phenomena. And often, uh, it depends on the lens with which you view the situation as to how you see uh, what was cause and what was effect. Uh, so I, I think it's very, very difficult to, um, to separate those two. Uh, in the air, for example, with, with um, high-speed computers, it's been possible to do uh, computations that were just never um, uh, uh, possible in the past. They would have taken far too long. And at the same time, we have now um, a whole field of chaos, uh, which really, it wouldn't be a field if we didn't have high-speed computers because it simply wouldn't be possible to look at the effects. But on the other hand, arguing whether there was a causal relationship between the availability of high-speed computers and the development of this field is, I think, just a very difficult, um, difficult debate. And, and, and what about the future? I mean, how do you see a society, uh, a post-industrial society, with uh, uh, these very high-tech uh, 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 networks? You know? uh, I see a lot of different things going on. One of the most fascinating things for me has been the uh, advent of electronic mail. In our department and within uh, the campus, uh, we have a huge number of electronic mail users, and it's, it's really changed the way we do work. Uh, for example, we have fewer meetings, and we resolve many more issues by just you know, sending out a, a message, and everybody responds by the end of the day. And so it's resolved uh, and, and wasn't necessary to call a meeting. Uh, in our department, there's actually been somewhat of a backlash. Uh, where uh, several members of the faculty said, wait a moment, uh, we never talk. Um, it's so easy to do this that uh, you know the casual sorts of conversations that might arise if we were sitting around a table having a meeting uh, simply can't take place. Um, and uh, so it seems to me that you know, in each of the areas where we have these advances, or not advances, but at least changes, um, it's just going to be necessary for us to uh, essentially f figure out good ways to use them and figure out how to make them beneficial. And uh, at the beginning, I'm sure there'll be equal number of instances of uh, situations where technology is not at all you know, serving the goals of, of the group or of society. Um, sure. Uh, just have to say it from the beginning so it doesn't sound like I'm starting in the middle. <laughs> uh, um, the as we look at uh, the impact of technology in um, a whole broad range of our lives, we certainly have to ask the question, 
what are the advantages and what are the disadvantages or, or what are the trade-offs that uh, come about with advanced uh, technology. And uh, as I mentioned with electronic mail, we've, we've seen real advances in the frequency and uh, uh, intensity of, of, of communication where we might only get together once every two weeks for a discussion of the faculty. Uh, with electronic mail, we tend to communicate sometimes twice a day about issues that wouldn't be a part of the full community uh, in the old style of communication. Uh, of course, there are, there are uh, potential drawbacks to this approach, as was raised by, our by some members of our faculty. What about uh, opportunities for sort of random and casual conversation and for people to bring up issues that maybe aren't as well formed as they need to be in order to be communicated by electronic mail. And indeed, the response of the faculty was to schedule regular meetings that had virtually no agenda in order to take advantage of, of this uh, sort of loophole in, in our current system. And uh, it seems to me that what we're going to see with this rapidly advancing technology is a constant uh, need to sort of try things out and then uh, discover what might be some downsides to them and then try to find ways to build a better understanding of how to use the technology effectively. Uh, in the case of electronic mail, uh, in our department at least, I think we're just still trying to construct an understanding of an effective way to use it. And we view each uh, week as a new experiment and as an opportunity for us to sort of sit back and reflect and decide on, on new strategies for using it effectively. Uh, I think this is simply a microcosm of the situation that is characteristic uh, across the board with technology. In education, uh, looking backward at, at the way technology has been used for instruction, it's fascinating to see kind of what's taken place. Initially, uh, everybody said, oh great, you know, here we have these computers, they're going to save teachers time, they might even take over the role of teachers, uh, and so let's find ways to use them. Then, uh, looking at actually what were the initial uses of technology in the classroom, it was incredibly discouraging. What we had were electronic workbooks. People were using the actually, you know, the least interesting or effective uh, tools of instruction and presenting them with computers. So, in fact, if anything, it was a step backward from uh, the situation before computers were available. But that was only the first step. Uh, at the same time as uh, people were developing electronic uh, workbooks, uh, other researchers were thinking more uh, in a more far-reaching fashion about what some of the potential of technology was for education. And for example, we have simulation environments which allow students to really conduct experiments and investigate phenomena in ways that wouldn't be possible in their classroom. Uh, indeed, in the research that I've been doing, we have students conducting experiments about naturally occurring thermodynamics problems. And what we've been trying to do is expand the curriculum beyond the traditional, very cut and dried sorts of experiments that are typical in science classrooms to the sort of uh, complex and uh, often ambiguous situations that are more likely to be encountered in the real world. And what we've found is that we can use these simulation environments to actually help students bridge the knowledge that they would do in traditional science experiments over to the kinds of situations they would encounter in their real lives. So instead of just understanding that uh, water heats in a sort of uh, straight line curve and then um, plateaus at boiling, uh, they actually extend this understanding to try to explain um, experiences that they encounter outside of class. One really good example is uh, when we did the unit on uh, conduction and insulation, um, virtually all the students immediately understood that uh, things like styrofoam uh, were good insulators and, and things like metal were, were poor insulators. But when we carried this over into naturally occurring problems and asked students, for example, then what would you use to wrap a Coke that you were taking for, for lunch um, so it would be cold when, when lunchtime came? Um, the students almost to the person said, oh, I'd wrap it in aluminum foil. And uh, you know, this was completely contradictory to the experiments that they just conducted in class. And so we said, well, now, why is that? 
And uh, the students responded, well, um, I've, I've always wrapped it in aluminum foil. My mother wrapped it in aluminum foil. I think this is the, the sort of mother lunch syndrome. You have to wrap everything in something, and you know, aluminum foil is the only thing that fits around the Coke, so um, that's what you wrap it in. Um, but then we probed further, and we said to the students, well, well why is it? And uh, it turned out that um, students had a conception of metal as sort of having this active property of, um, of, of essentially imparting warmth to, uh, to an object. Um, so instead of thinking of, of metals as, as conductors, they actually thought of them as, um, as potentially having the, the um, possibility of heating things up. And when we went on and asked the students, uh, well now, what about wrapping your, your cold drink in, in a wool sweater? Uh, what would that do for, for keeping it cool for your lunch? Um, the students were, were quite um, skeptical of our suggestion and essentially argued that uh, you know, sweaters uh, were for keeping you warm, and so, so the sweater would warm you up. Um, and uh, clearly, the aluminum foil would be a far better uh, thing to use for, for this um, experiment, for, for keeping their drink cold. Um, so what we did was build a uh, simulation environment where students could explore a broad range of experiments, such as uh, keeping their drink cold and keeping their soup warm and uh, hot chocolate and potatoes, et cetera. Um, so that the context of their experimentation was closer to the context of their everyday lives. And we found that uh, this has had a dramatic impact on students' understanding of, of insulation and conduction and their ability to apply it to new problems that they would encounter outside of class. And that's just one example of, um, of this basic phenomenon. We've really extended it to, to other uh, concepts as well. So I think there's an example of where uh, the technological tools can be used in the service of an objective for uh, instruction that, that's, that's clearly um, one that, that is, is, is valuable and, and, and appropriate. Another example of the kind of thing that people started to do after they abandoned electronic workbooks was to build what have been called micro-worlds. These are sort of like models of scientific phenomena that allow students to explore the main variables, for example, uh, in uh, the physics of motion, and and really get feedback uh, that's clean and easy to understand, and use that to build a better understanding of um, motion. And as uh, in the case of the simulations that I described, that before these micro worlds have had the impact of um, very definitely improving students' understanding of physics phenomena. Although um, the initial efforts to use microworlds were successful, subsequent refinements um, have included, for example, building a sequence of microworlds that become progressively more um, complex, um, again taking advantage of the need for science instruction to help students deal with complexity, while at the same time um, helping students to uh, sort of handle the complexity by slowly adding it to their world rather than sort of being confronted with it uh, instantaneously. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons that students have difficulty extending what they do in the classroom to um, their everyday experiences is because they, they just haven't, in the classroom the experiments are really trivially simple, all the other variables are stripped away, but that doesn't happen when they leave the classroom. Do you believe that in the future that uh, the computer will replace the face-to-face -face teaching? No, I don't. I believe that um, what we will find is that uh, we'll continue to experiment with what the role of the teacher should be and what the role of, of these technologies might be in education, and uh, that we'll be able to find a different balance between the use of technology and the role of the teacher than has uh, been identified in the past, and indeed that the availability of technology may be a catalyst for some changes that perhaps ought to have happened long ago, um, such as uh, perhaps reconsidering whether we should always have one teacher and 32 students together for the entire day, or whether there might be more flexible arrangements of the ratio between teachers and students. Uh, in addition, I think uh, computers have catalyzed uh, uh, a, a sort of resurgence of interest in cooperative learning. Often the availability of technology dictates that students work in groups at a computer because there simply aren't enough. Um, and 
initially I think this was a pretty bad idea. What happened is a few students got to use the computer and the rest were essentially left out. Uh, but again, um, what we've seen is that uh, teachers, researchers, and uh, um, uh, students have worked together to find a better way to use the technology. And so in some classrooms now, uh, the cooperative activities that are set up between students and teachers, students and computers, uh, really take advantage of the computer and of the cooperative group. Uh, for example, at some times, obviously, a divide and conquer strategy is a good idea where the members of the group each go off and do different tasks and then report back to the group. Uh, at other times, uh, the group is uh, used effectively for brainstorming ideas concerning what might be the next thing to do. And um, at still other times, an individual might take the ideas raised by the group uh, and synthesize them. So um, it's not that uh, uh, this sort of coercion of the computer to form cooperative groups was by any means a, a solution to an educational problem, but rather that uh, the computer sort of catalyzed uh, the students and researchers to think more creatively about how students might work effectively in groups. And indeed, in this particular instance, I think the payoff has, has been greater than, than would have been anticipated. That is, that we've found effective ways to use cooperative experiences uh, across the board, not just in situations where technology is present. Uh, I've told you a lot of positive examples. I certainly don't think that all the uses of technology are going to pay off. In fact, an area where it seems as if there's been virtually no progress and perhaps not much payoff is in attempts to design intelligent tutoring systems. Uh, at least up to the present, these have not really resulted in uh, experiences that have been positive for students. Uh, by and large, students have viewed intelligent tutors as sort of more like these electronic workbooks that they had in the past. The attempts on the part of researchers to build tutoring systems that are more responsive to the kinds of understandings of the students uh, than a typical electronic workbook, which virtually is unresponsive, have been pretty unsuccessful. And at the moment, I, I don't exactly see what direction or what positive directions that, that particular line of um, using technology in education is likely to take. So uh, it's certainly not the case that everything uh, is a rosy direction, but on the other hand, um, I think this is in, in, in all science, um, the, the strategy that seems most effective is one where uh, essentially there's trial, examination of the feedback, and refinement of the interaction uh, with uh, the expectation that the next trial will actually uh, be better than the one before. <coughs> Did you add or do you have any experience about making an intermediate project with interactivity and how people boost their level boost their CBA? What do you think about it? Well, the, these new optical media, especially laser discs and CD-ROMs, um, are very appealing to software developers who are concerned about instruction because uh, traditional media, um, especially just microcomputers, uh, just can't provide enough verbal uh, feedback and visual information for students. But we're just at the beginning of the learning curve with these technologies. And so far, the kinds of things that I've seen are really pretty discouraging. It's sort of like an electronic book or an electronic database of pictures. That's not a terrible thing, but in fact, it's not an obvious win for education. Uh, just as the first books that were appearing on computers were, I mean, they were impossible. We already knew how to browse through books, and what good would it do to have the text on screen where you couldn't browse in any of your traditional ways? Uh, similarly, it seems to me we know how to browse through um, art books, and putting all of those pictures on a laser disc doesn't improve our understanding of that material. Um, but I, I'm seeing some real glimmers of um, effective use of a video disc and CD-ROM in education. One thing that looks promising is to model the cognitive understandings that uh, uh, teachers and, and, and good students use to solve problems. Often what teachers do is they go to the bo board and they solve a complicated problem without giving you any insight into how they came up with the next step. They just, you know, lay the steps out. Uh, programming teachers go and they write a long, complicated program on the board, and frequently the message that the students get is, um, 
no problem. You know, when I read the problem, I should just start writing down those lines and I'll be done. Uh, when in fact, the person who solved the problem spent hours um, uh, considering many different solutions. They didn't start at the beginning. They probably started in the middle. They um, used a variety of visual and uh, other cues to, to reason about the problem. And only after a long period of work did they come up with this elegant solution that is now being presented to the student. Well, it seems likely that we could use uh, video disc um, as a really excellent resource of experts thinking through the solutions to complicated problems, and that that would provide kind of a library of, um, of reasoning strategies uh, for students that might empower them to realize that those are the ways that people actually think. Um, so in a way, it might be um, uh, putting Feynman on video disc uh, might be a very uh, a very creative way to use this technology effectively for instruction. Do you believe that uh, as far as the teacher is concerned, that uh, it would be for everybody very important to know how to use the computer so then within the university you know and so on? Knowing how to use the computer is a really complicated statement. I mean, what does it mean to use a computer? The initial computers, it was really complicated. You had to uh, learn something about electronics, and you were at the back of the computer flipping switches. Um, today, when you use your microwave oven or your automated teller, you're essentially using a computer. So as far as whether people need to learn how to use computers, um, in a fundamental sense, everybody's going to have to use computers. They're going to be a part of people's lives. Whether that's going to be onerous is, is a completely different question. Uh, it seems clear that the direction is towards making computer use transparent so that you don't even know that you're actually using a computer. The computer is just in the background, and, and you're actually thinking and, and reasoning and solving problems. <laughs> so the, the computer is in the background, and you're just uh, thinking and reasoning and solving problems. Um, and uh, so I think that there's really not an answer to that question, that is, you know, how much do are people going to need to know about uh, computers uh, is going to depend on the kind of work that they do and the kind of activities that they engage in. Uh, many people will simply use computers without really knowing that they're doing it particularly at all. Um, others may find it necessary to know a great deal about computers because they'll prove to be fundamental to the investigations that they want to conduct. Uh, at the university today, virtually um, every faculty member has learned how to type. It used to be that, you know, you should, especially as a woman, never possibly learn to type because you might end up as a secretary. And uh, so the wonderful uh, turnaround now is that everybody has to learn to type in order to use the computer that has appeared in their office and turned out to be something they really wanted to use. Um, so it's, uh, it's sort of a, uh, an interesting um, change. Uh, students um, in school virtually all learn to type now, too. Um, when we first started doing research in uh, pre-college settings, uh, I was really worried because the students were very slow at typing or, or didn't know how to type, and it interfered with their ability to use technology. Today, by about sixth grade, students type, almost all students type faster than they can write. That doesn't mean that they type real fast, because they don't write very fast. but. Um, they, they almost all type faster than they can write. So in a sense, I mean, it's fascinating to see how we've um, become a society of typists um, just by virtue of the availability of computers. And you know, I suspect we'll continue to see these kinds of, of changes in the way people do work um, as, uh, as the computer technologies develop. I personally am looking forward to a computer that uh, types uh, a paper after I've dictated it without any intervention from a human. So when you were talking about typing on your computer, uh, uh, do you believe that uh, it, it is going to be also very important to know how to type really fast, or uh, you can type right with a typewriter? Um, as far as typing is concerned, I think it doesn't much matter um, as far as speed. It's just that it's turned out to be a major um, communication technology that wasn't uh, available or necessary in the past. and. Uh, at least the present uh, level of, of computer technology, it's a, it's a really essential skill, and, and virtually everybody has uh, come up with a way to enter information um, uh, into a computer using uh, the keyboard. So it's a, it's an, uh, a really fascinating um, 
uh, impact on society. Um, so, so the compu the question is, um, how are we going to? S uh, what are the relationships between the information explosion and the um, advent of uh, technologies? And how do we see these uh, databases that are becoming available actually being used by individuals? Um, it, it's certainly the case that uh, there's been an enormous explosion of information, and that a lot of that information is now available in uh, electronic databases. And it's also the case that it's not at all easy to use those databases, and it's especially difficult to use them effectively. Uh, we don't actually have particularly good skills in either building databases or in accessing the information in them. Uh, the most, the sort of traditional way that this has been done is, is in the straight, uh, completely linked database uh, where you have um, numbers going across this way and numbers coming down that way, and you go into a cell and get that information. And that's the model that most people have for retrieving information from a database. Uh, in contrast, it's, it's likely that we'll end up with uh, databases that are much more relational and much uh, more tree-like or networked rather than just grid-like. And uh, we don't have yet uh, models or skills for retrieving that kind of information. In some research that I've been doing on how people learn computer programming, I've first identified the sort of chunks of information that are typically used by expert programmers to solve problems. So experts don't think about individual lines of code or individual commands. They might think about a sort routine or a routine that uh, computes a mean or, or something like that. And when they solve problems, they put those pieces of information together in creative ways. Uh, one thing that we wanted to do was to help students learn about those chunks of information and learn about how to put them together. Uh, and this necessitated two sorts of issues relevant to, to this question. The first had to do with just representing these chunks of information, understanding them and maintaining them in memory. And for communicating that information, we found that it was particularly valuable to use multiple modes of representation. So one way to represent a, a computer problem solution is obviously in the code of the language. Uh, another way would be in a diagram where you showed the action of that particular routine. For example, a diagram of sorting might be dynamic and show um, individual numbers or letters or words moving uh, as a result of the execution of certain commands. Um, yet another representation might be natural language, where we would just describe what the action of that particular chunk of code was. Um, uh, yet another um, a representation might be a static drawing rather than dynamic drawing. And what we did was to try to create a database that had all of those representations of um, these individual chunks of information. And the first thing we did was to look to see if this would help people understand the chunks better than if they had a single representation. And what we found is that it, it was very valuable for students to have multiple representations, and furthermore, that different students uh, sort of tried to gain the knowledge about these chunks in different ways. Some students preferred the verbal description, others preferred the diagrams, others wanted to look at code. Still others preferred to start with an example where the code was embedded in a program and then move back into the um, more abstract representations of the chunk. So, so a first step was sort of thinking about what information you'd put in such a database and how, you know, how would that information be consistent with the cognitive skills of the learner. Once uh, we decided on that, we then had this next extremely difficult problem of, suppose we made a database of 100 of these what we call templates or chunks of, of, of programming knowledge, how would anybody find them? Uh, what would they look for? What would be a key to, to locating this information? How indeed would they even know what was in there? Um, and, and this led to two, I think, very hard problems that have been um, part of research in general on how people um, uh, use uh, databases. Uh, the first uh, was sort of um, how, do you, uh, how do you even understand what's there? How do you learn these things in context and then know that they're there to find in the future? 
to, to, com to accomplish that, what we did was to present the chunks of programming knowledge in the context of the solution to a very complicated programming problem. We called it a case study drawing on the sort of business or um, medical literature where you do a case study of a complicated medical case or, or a complicated uh, uh, business case. And uh, that's how we presented the template so that students knew what they were looking for in the database. That turned out to be far more effective than presenting them in isolation. I think that, that sort of makes sense just from a, a simple thought experiment. Um, the next thing that we did, though, was much more complicated, which was how do people browse this database of information once it exists? And uh, we've been working on different browsing tools to help students find the information that they want in this database. Um, and I think that at the moment what we think is that in the future we're going to be developing sort of browsing toolboxes so that individuals will personally create their own browsing tools that are suited to their own understanding of the subject matter and uh, techniques that they use for personally searching information. Uh, for example, some students using this database like to find a complicated template and then look for sub-templates and then go to the sub-templates in order to sort of find the information that they wanted. Other people wanted to build up. You know, they'd start with simple elements and say, well, where did this go? Oh, here are the bigger elements. Those are the ones I want. Um, still others liked um, categories concerned with processing um, information. So uh, uh, we sort of set high-level um, categories that uh, programs might be sorted into, and we found that some students liked going into the database that way. It was difficult to figure out what those categories might be. Uh, so we created groups of these templates, and we had experts sort them and tell us what their categories were. And then we put those categories back into the database so other people could use them for locating information. But um, it's, it's certainly a non-trivial problem. It's a very fascinating one. But it's one that I think will require a great deal of research before we can create personalized and reasonable databases that people can use to get the information that might be useful for them in the future.